Good evening, <laughs> and, and welcome to the first of the Department of Architecture lectures tonight. When I, um, when I see photographs of Peter Zumtor's work, and I say photographs because I haven't seen the buildings, I'm deeply ambivalent. Um, and I'm ambivalent because there's a certain rigor, for sure. There may be even a profundity, um, but they seem so out of time. Um, and I think, for me, it's, it's a kind of condition where um, he seems to, to, have, to have, it's not going backwards. I don't want to say romantic or nostalgic. It's rather a kind of going forward, if it's possible, to a pre-urban condition or going forward to an anti-urban condition that seems, that makes me uncomfortable. You know what I think of? I think of the so-called um, uh, mystic minimalist musicians like Arvo Peart or someone who, who after, after becoming frustrated with Schoenberg and Shostakovich, um, tried to go forward by returning to very simple rhythms, single notes or triads, uh, almost kind of monastic, again, anti-urban monastic chants, not nostalgic, but to go forward to an anti-urban condition. And this, I think, uh, is a radical conservatism. Um, but I have a sense that uh, after tonight, it, I, I, know, I know what it is. It's, it's, I know what it is. It's, they fulfill, both the music and the buildings fulfill archaic human needs precisely at a time when we shouldn't have those needs. And, but my sense is that all this is going to be challenged tonight with our speaker, Peter, uh, sorry, Peter, Sumter, right, uh, with our speaker, Philippe uh, Ursprung. Um, Philippe uh, did his uh, doctoral work in art history and history and architecture at the Free University in Berlin. He's now professor at the University of Zurich. He will be moving soon this year. Uh, to the ETH in Zurich, and we're very pleased because we have with the GSD and the ETH a relationship that we hope we can uh, extend and, and, and reactivate and elaborate um, with Philippe. A lot of his work has to uh, looks at relationships of art and architecture in different ways. Most of you know the CCA exhibition on Herzog and de Moron called Natural History, and this kind of stunning catalog that came from that exhibition. There's also a book on Olafur Eliasson uh, out maybe a year or so ago. Um, and then a book on um, uh, the, uh, Alan Capro and Robert Smithson uh, that I think is already in German, but will soon be coming out of University of California Press in uh, English. So we're very pleased tonight to have Philippe uh, Ursprung to uh, challenge my ambivalence of Zumtor. Philippe. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction, and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very honored and pleased uh, to be here. More than the um, legendary episode at the beginning of Marcel Proust's novel, Remembrance of Things Past, when the narrator dips a Madeleine into a cup of tea and experiences a flashback to his childhood, I was always intrigued by another lesser-known episode at the end of the novel, namely the moment when the narrator gives way to an approaching carriage in a courtyard in Paris, steps back and stumbles against some unevenly placed paving stones. He remains there 
repeating the movement, one foot upon the higher flagstone, the other on the lower. He tries to figure out what this movement reminds him of, while the passers-by watch him with amusement. Eventually, he recalls the same sensation he had many years ago and is overwhelmed with happiness. Quote, it was Venice. The occurrence in the courtyard evoked the feeling he had experienced as he, quote, stood on two uneven stones in the baptistery of St. Mark's. Now, what uh, a post here describes, the tactile sensation of the uneven ground under his slow-moving feet, is intrinsically connected to what uh, Maurice Albwax described as spatial memory. And this spatial memory, I would argue, is a crucial component of the architectural experience. Peter Zumto is among those architects who consider more than just the visual aspects of a project. For him, it is not only important how a facade looks, but how a floor, stair, or wall feel when one touches them with one's fingertips, how they smell, how they resonate, and what kind of associations, mental images, expectations, and memories they evoke. His buildings always revolve around the relationship between the human body and its environment and the way the individual subject experiences very specific situations. This is a photo I took last week when I was in his studio in Haldenstein. Uh, we see him here working on um, the project uh, Memorial in Memory of the Victims of Witch Trials that he is um, doing with, uh, together with the late Louise Bourgeois in Bardo, uh, Norway. However, it took me some time to realize this. Until some years ago, I had uh, the same image as uh, Michael has, a very clear yet narrow um, image of his architecture. I had much respect for the beauty and atmospheric effects of his buildings. I admired the calm pace um, with which his small team in the 90s, it was two, three, four persons. Uh, today, it's uh, 30 people working in the office in Haldenstein, uh, Switzerland. How they produced projects uninterested in expansion and spending more inventive energy on seemingly marginal projects than many architects invest in skyscrapers. So, for example, the... Um, the, uh, the door that you see here uh, took one and a half years to develop. Nevertheless, I could not subscribe to Zumthor's idea of authenticity, uh, his anachronistic conception of nature, and the romantic impulse that I felt pervaded his oeuvre. Although I had visited some of his... Um, um, projects such as the uh, protective housing for uh, Roman ruins in Kur, his uh, very first project, the famous um, uh, thermal baths in Vals, and the museum in uh, Bregenz, Austria. My image of his work was mainly influenced by photographs, especially those that you've already seen of the St. Benedict Chapel built in 1987 in Sumwich, in the Swiss Alps, taken by the Swiss photographer Hans Danuser. So Danuser's interpretation, depicting the chapel in misty black and white photographs, had shaped my image of Zumthor as an earthbound architect working far from urban centers in the remoteness of an untouched landscape. And my view of Danuser was just as certain. I first encountered his work in 1989 in the exhibition In Vivo in Aarau, Switzerland. His grainy black and white images of cooling towers, laboratories, and dissecting tables were both fascinating and discomfortable. In much the same way that they responded to Zumthor's architecture, skepticism colored my reaction to an artistic approach that seemed to me to be rooted in the neo-expressionism of the 80s and that favored an anti-modernism and pathos alien to my way of thinking. 
Then in early 2004, I went to visit St. Benedict Chapel. I walked through the tiny hamlet above Sumwich. A narrow gravel road leads up to the chapel. The effort of walking uphill, the crunching gravel under my shoes, the smell of fresh pines in the nearby forest, and the arrangement of the small buildings shaped my perspective. I was waiting for my mental image of a remote chapel hovering the sublime alpine landscape to materialize. Then suddenly the building appeared before me much smaller than expected. Instead of finding a desolate edifice tucked away in the Alps, merging with the landscape, I came face to face with one of the most elegant, fragile structures I've ever seen. Not since my first sight of Herzog and de Meron's Eberswalde library had any new architecture made such a deep impression on me. The few narrow concrete steps that led to the door of the chapel felt not only firmer than the gravel road, but also more comfortable. After the ascent on the rough path, the steps of the chapel required no effort. My impression was not so much to ascend the steps, but to descend towards the chapel. My strenuous walking turned into a relaxed striding. My movements became more measured, more rhythmically structured, more focused. They became appropriate to the building, so to speak. And I remembered the episode by Marcel Proust. Almost automatically, my hand followed the thin metal handrail the way one holds onto a gangway before boarding a ship. I was now facing the door panel made from vertical wooden lath. It appeared lighter and more welcoming than the usual massive doors barring church entrances, but I had a brief moment of hesitation. Will the chapel be locked? Did I make the long journey in vain? Then the door swung open almost by itself. The unexpectedly long door handle, which increased the leverage and lay in the hand like a comfortable tool, facilitated the entry further. From the very beginning, I was already involved in the chapel's speciality. I became part of a choreography of everyday movements and gestures. I was neither impressed nor dwarfed by the building. On the contrary, it made me pay attention because of its fragility. The details of the building subtly guided the way I moved and helped me become familiar with the environment. Later, Peter Zumto told me that he always developed his spaces from a bodily experience and, quote, a feeling for the body, for a physical presence or a certain aura motivated the design process. As I entered the building, I felt as if I were putting on a coat. The moment of entry was not marked by a specific threshold, but by the sudden change of perception. My experience was discontinuous in the sense that the outside was incompatible with the inside. The process of transition resembled a series of cuts in a cinematic montage. The warmth and softness of the wooden floor under my shoes clearly differed from the coolness of the concrete steps. Inside the chapel, the smell of the wood was radically different from outside where the scent of the forest mixed with the meadow. Because the floor seemed to be suspended, I felt like I was part of a resonant body walking through some kind of huge instrument that echoed the noise of my footsteps. The light was unexpectedly bright. However, because there was no view to the outside, I was taken aback. While approaching the chapel, my movement had been linear, so to speak. Once inside, however, the teardrop-shaped floor plan directed my movement into a loop or spiral until I eventually sat down on one of the massive wooden benches. For Catholic believers, this was certainly uh, the moment for prayer. For me, it became a moment of great attention where the memories of my trip to the chapel, the transition from outside to inside, the various sensation and the reflection on the side are blurred. So my image of St. Benedict Chapel had changed. Or more precisely, I could no longer reduce the building to a mere image. I now perceived it as a narrative structure, almost like a movie. 
Instead of a misty phantasm dissolving into the surrounding landscape, I was facing a contemporary building. In fact, it was a building so up-to-date that it seemed to have been built just recently, not almost 20 years ago. So it's built in 87, early 88. I was there in 2004, uh, so almost 20 years after. I was in a remote part of the Alps, yet this building did not subscribe to any local typological conventions. For example, it is built entirely of wood, not of stone, as every other Alpine chapel. Rather than relating to the local context and historical tradition, this chapel was in dialogue with the international cutting-edge architectural discourse. Several years before the notion of topological architecture appeared, Zomto had designed a building that seemed to consist entirely of surfaces. These surfaces are superposed on each other, unfolding in layers and defining or performing a topological spatiality rather than a continuous spatiality. There was no such thing as a window that would have better articulated transition between inside and outside, and would have been a sign for a more conventional spatial continuity. Instead, the roof seemed to be slightly lifted like the lid on a pot to let in some light. The, the wall, if one wants to call it like that, the uttermost layer covered with shingles that were pulled around the building like a textile membrane, spread apart only as far as necessary to give way to an opening that could hardly be defined as a door. Furthermore, the building was anything but earthbound. The few steps before the entrance seemed to hesitate before actually touching the chapel, as if a direct connection between the ground and the building would be impossible. The topography of the alpine landscape and the topology of the architecture were incompatible and discontinuous. So I would argue that the Zumthor's chapel anticipated much of the architectural debate of recent years. The topological design inspired by the Möbius strip uh, produced by architects just as UN Studio. Here is the uh, Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart that opened uh, two years ago, or um, here the Yokohama terminal by foreign office architects look in comparison to Tsumto's much earlier solutions like illustrations for a theoretical treatise. And even the landmark of the Swiss National Exhibition in 2002, Dillas Cofidio's Blur Building, which I regarded at the time as a groundbreaking exploration of atmospheric effects, now seemed to have been merely limping along behind the rhetoric of its own makers. Moreover, Tumto's chapel was not, as I had feared, simply self-referential. On the contrary, it changed the way I perceived the surroundings and seemed to imbue the whole valley with a sense of movement. It was not about autonomy and isolation. Far from it, this design was about associations. The built structures sharpened my eye for the terrain as a whole, and it articulated the energy flowing through this region. And I do not mean this in the sense of esoteric energy lines. There's many people going in this area to find those lines. Uh, so it's not about, about those lines. It's about um, the institutional connections, for example, that still link the Catholic Church in this part of the Rhine Valley with the once mighty monastery of Dysentis nearby. And even more important, in the sense of the generation of hydroelectric power that is crucial to this region. This alpine landscape was also an industrial landscape, a landscape that was urban, entirely man-made. Henri Lefebvre's hypothesis of the complete urbanization, I thought, was correct. I was not on the periphery, but right at the heart of a network that extended to Berlin, New York, and Tokyo. Now, I'm not uh, relating to this experience in order to emphasize my own subjectivity. 
my perception is part of a more general shift in perception that pervaded architecture in the 80s, but has only recently been conceptualized, namely the transition from the notion of architecture as a system of signs, as a text or language that can be read, to that of architecture as an image that affects the viewer and is experienced. We try to... Uh, outline this shift in a, in a book that appeared a couple of years ago where we tried to introduce the notion of the image into the architectural discourse. Central to this trend that is today generally and referred to as the pictorial turn or iconic turn is the role of photography. And in this process, the meeting between Danuser, the photographer, and Zumthor, the architect, becomes significant. So this, this revision of my view of Zumthor's architecture also made me take a closer look at Danuser's photograph. And it was only now that I realized uh, that, of course, this photograph did not exist in isolation. It is part of a series of photographs that, in my mind, had run together into a single image. In response to a commission from Zumthor, Danuser had taken these photographs with a Hasselblad um, of the early, newly constructed chapel in 1988. The result was a series of six square black and white photographs. They were first shown in exhibitions in Lucerne and Graz in 88 and then published in Du, Ottagono and Domus. So they were spread and they were perceived in the architectural world. Danusa had photographed different aspects of the interior and the exterior as though a single image could not do the chapel justice. So his interest was not, as I had thought, simply in evoking a certain atmosphere, but rather in addressing a much more fundamental issue, that is to say, making uh, something invisible visible. So the series begins with a shot of the chapel and its surroundings. Now, it's interesting to note that Danusa did not photograph the spectacular view over the Alpine valley of Surselva. This is uh, the same moment, mid-1980s, uh, Atelier 5 on your left and uh, Mario Botta on your right. So typical uh, architecture photography which would show the building and the view. But, uh, of course, this becomes so conventional that, in a way, the building cancels the view of the landscape and the landscape cancels the view on the building. So by deliberately turning his back on the view, Danusa managed to sidestep this Alpine cliché and in so doing drew attention to the surfaces and the textures and the specific materiality of this area. Another factor that was at odds with my mental image was that the chapel is not actually shrouded in banks of mist. In reality, the mist conceals rather what is behind it or beyond it. Consequently, it is not, um, as in Caspar David Friedrich's paintings of isolated Churchill, to just take this uh, well-known example, part of another world, but rather something which is unsublime. The chapel looks like a foreign body that has landed there, smashed into the ground with the same brutality as the sharp-edged rocks that bespeak the destructive power of nature. At that time, many uh, would still vividly have remembered the powder avalanche of February 1984 that had destroyed the original medieval chapel just 200 meters away. And the bell tower, everyone would call it like that, um, it's equally unsettling. In my memory, it was something like a tree, but in reality, it looks more like a pylon for the cables and mountain railways that crisscross this area, an element that both connects and divides. In short, my romantic image of architecture that um, has become one with nature was right out of kilter with both Zumthor's architecture and Danusa's interpretation. My new view of Danusa's photography now gave me the impression that it is not about the aesthetic connection between the building and the landscape, but that it brings to light something that is generally overlooked, that is to say, the economic connection. 
if we take this shot of the fence that is almost touching the chapel with um, uh, as something that is more than just picturesque, more interesting then this formal effect becomes what it tells us about the financial pressures that are ever-present in this mountainous region and the pragmatic solutions that the locals came up with. Danuser avoids any hint of the nostalgic evocation of a supposedly intact pre-industrial world. He shows the viewer how these artifacts, the fence and the chapel, are made. The roughly worked branches rammed into the ground supporting the cheap bark offcuts from a sawmill are byproducts of the timber trade. So, in a way, he, he is helping us or making us to look at the chapel with the eye of the farmers, the joiners, the carpenters, and thus illuminates the work process and with the photograph tells us more about Zumtor's architectural methods than any text that mentions that he was trained as a cabinet maker. This is a detail which basically only now is sort of made public. He tried to, to hide this, this fact uh, in the 80s and early 90s. A similar subtle insight into the chapel's making is to be had from the details of the floor before and after the benches were installed. Although the boards are small and hence cheap, the variety and ornamental nature of the wood grain greatly enhances the chapel's interior. A shot of another detail looks like a technical commentary on the construction showing how the load-bearing uprights are connected to the wall. Now, for me, this is highly significant in terms of spatial theory. It shows that for Zumtor, it is just not possible to think of a space other than as being defined by a sequence of textile planes, like a tent or a stage that achieves its effect by means of curtains and sets. These are all flat surfaces. Again, this would uh, go into the a hypothesis of a topological architecture avant la lettre. Now, how did Zumthor and Danuser make contact? In the early 80s, Danuser was already working his way from photography as an applied art to art photography. In 84, he was the first photographer to be awarded an atelier grant by the city of Zurich that allowed him to go to New York. In 85, he exhibited three series of photographs in Kunstmuseum Kur. Zumto saw this exhibition and later decided to commission Danusa to take photographs of San Benedetto. The two agreed that Danusa would have a free hand, and it was this encounter between Hans Danusa's photography and Peter Zumto's architecture that was to instigate change in the portrayal of architecture in Switzerland and beyond. At the same time that Danusa's photographs were on view in Lucerne, the Architecture Museum in Basel was showing the exhibition Architektur Denkform, Architecture as a Way of Thinking, by Jacques Herzog and Pierre Demeron. So this is their first uh, exhibition that was perceived. And they confronted the problem of representation of architecture by uh, covering the the glass uh, walls, the, the big windows of this modernist building by very large uh, translucent photographs of their own projects. So one could sort of see outside but only filtered through uh, these uh, grainy uh, depictions of, of, their, of their project which were like phantoms uh, part of, of the building. And then in 1991... So three years later, they participated in the Architecture Biennale in Venice uh, by showing photographs of the building shot by four different artists. And this was the beginning of their collaboration with Thomas Ruff, who would remain up to the present day uh, a close a colleague. Uh, here you see a shot taken at the um, exhibition uh, um, Natural History at the CCA in 2002 with in the... Um, uh, on the wall, this image by uh, Thomas Ruff, which shows their, uh, their storage hall, uh, Ricola Laufen. So this is a, a brief period uh, and has a particular place, I would say, in the history of the relationship between photography and architecture. 
one could argue that it has something in common with the late 20s when Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona pavilion for the World Exhibition of 29 was photographed. It was dismantled again after the exhibition and it, as, as though the pavilion had been built just for the camera and was only through photography that it became an icon of modern architecture. After 2000, the onset of signature architecture marked the end of this period during which architecture and art, art slash photography, uh, converged so predictably. Although many artists have actively engaged with architecture these days, aside from exceptions such as Hélène Binet, architectural photography is once again a propaganda tool and not an instrument of critical reflection. In the meantime, perhaps video or video installation has established itself as a useful means to represent architecture. And um, I just want to show this image from, uh, from Peter Zumthor's exhibition in Bregenz 2007, where he tried to represent uh, his architecture by video installations by the Austrian artist uh, Sixt Petrich. Uh, in my view, a very, uh, very good way to, to, a very adequate way to represent architecture, which uh, has not been, uh, not been distributed because there's no catalog, for example, so this exhibition has happened almost uh, unnoticed. So, once again, why did Tumto choose Danuser to portray his first buildings? In order to shed additional light on his choice, I would like to take a look at Danuser's exhibition in Kur. It arose from a project dating back to 1980 that was known by the title Economy, Industry, Science and Research. On view in Kur were shots from the series Atomic Energy, Gold and Medicine. The photographs were taken in sites such as Los Alamos, New Jersey, Switzerland, France, and Germany. The themes were, among others, genetic engineering, uh, atomic energy, um, production of gold. So it was um, um, became clear to me that Danusa's approach was not primarily expressive, that for him the creation of an atmosphere and the evocation of the uncanny were less important than analysis but not only analysis of an object, but above all of the way that the public perceived these issues in those days. So I find it interesting that Danusa does not deny the pathos. He does not deny emotion. Uh, he even nurtures it in the viewer. Uh, so he's not about to deconstruct the emotion. He's not about to, um, like what, what, um, what uh, Alan Sekula, to give a contemporary example from a different approach would do, who tries to desublimate and deconstruct um, uh, this emotionality. He, he tries to, to maintain it, but he does not uh, try to um, evoke the numinous as such as, for example, James Welling would do. So Danusa's aim was not to identify his shots with particular places as a documentary photographer would do, but rather to represent general Types. He showed how human beings penetrated the very heart of matter, the innermost workings of the mechanisms of life, how they seek to control and manipulate the forces of nature. His work was about centers of power that elude representation, places that were inaccessible, invisible to the public, yet preoccupied the collective imagination in those days. So, for example, the issue of nuclear power was, uh, I would say, one of the main debates of the decade, but there was no image from the inside. So he went there. Of course, there was nothing to see, but it's about this, this dilemma that his photographs are. Uh, today, we would call these themes uh, biopolitics or biopower, the term that Foucault coins in the 70s, but nobody uses until now. So that would be an answer why, why Tsumtor is attracted by Danusa's approach. On the one hand, his own designs are based on images. That is to say, his intention is to give three-dimensional expression to particular mental images that he has uh, with him. He must have been fascinated by the fact that Danusa concentrated almost exclusively on interiors, 
and he may have felt an affinity here with his own design methods that always work out from the inside and that assume an element of discontinuity. In other words, that assume it is impossible for the interior to fully correspond to the exterior. But most importantly, it seems to me his own work, like that of Danus, is about articulating latent processes about envisioning the invisible. This is very clear, for example, in his first project called Protective Housing for Roman Archaeological Excavations in Cour, built in 86, where the architectural shell not only echoes the contours of long-gone Roman houses, it also directs the viewer's gaze to the scarcely visible remnants of a lost civilization. In a way, there's nothing to see there. It's, it's, it's the traces of a, of a civilization which was at this site, which has gone, and which is evoked like a phantom, uh, but the actual remnants are there, but they're also not there. So in St. Benedict, this invisible, one could argue, is uh, the religious faith that architects, painters, and sculptors have sought to portray ever since antiquity. But more interesting in my view, it is also the complex historical, economical, and social makeup of the whole region of Suselva, a topic that has often been forgotten or repressed by the cliché of the intact mountain area. So comparing the images of St. Benedict and the works shown in Danusa's exhibition, one cannot help but be struck by the similarity by the first picture of the chapel and the image of the nuclear power station. The exhibition opens with shots uh, taken in and above a cooling tower. Now, while the silhouettes of cooling towers are familiar, almost emblematic, the interior of these towers defy representation. The dark space, only dimly lit from above, is filled with swaths of mist. Were it not for the sloping concrete columns, one might easily take this for a cathedral. So this shot of the dark interior, in a way, matches the shots of the pale upper edge of the cooling tower that show the thin concrete wall cloaked in mist. And in the same vein, one might easily imagine this shot were taken from a viewing platform in the Alps or from a crest of a dam. So the natural phenomenon of the mist mingles with industrially produced steam, the invisible threat inherent in technology, and we should recall that the explosion of the reactor at Chernobyl in the Soviet Union happened on 26 April 1986 and drastically demonstrated the deadly danger of nuclear power and the fact that this danger was totally invisible. So everybody at that time was um, obsessed by this invisible danger. Were we allowed to eat fruit? What is okay if we would play outside? What happened? Because you could not see it. It was all invisible. So um, th this, this, uh, this threat, this, this, this fear counters the atmospheric beauty of the, of course, harmless water vapor. So once again, I would like to look at the past. In the 50s, the construction of hydroelectric power stations in Grisons heralded a period of rapid economic growth. The energy industry and the tourist industry drove the region's upsurge, and many mountain communities, including Vals, where now is this famous bath by Peter Zomtor, um, were villages struck by extreme poverty. So everybody would move because there was absolutely no labor. They were at the, at the very edge of, of financial collapse. So these villages, this whole area, owe their prosperity to these power stations, that is to say to the construction of large-scale complexes and the payments made for the waters they used. Since the 50s, the Nordostschweizerische Kraftwerke AG, NOK, has been the main player in these developments. The company planned to construct one of Switzerland's largest power station systems in the Soselva with seven reservoirs, 140 kilometers of tunnels, eight operating stations, and an output of 2,000 gigawatt hours. It is almost a quarter of, a, of an atomic energy uh, plant. Although these plans were not totally realized, the region was fundamentally 
affected. The hydroelectric power stations built between the 60s and 80s with its complex system of reservoirs, tunnels, etc., literally plowed up the mountain landscape around Sumvich. So this region is now inextricably connected with the factories and transportation routes in the heavily populated areas of Switzerland heartlands. The nuclear power stations run by NOK, uh, they were started in 79 and 84, are connected with numerous pumping stations in the Alps. And uh, that's that's sort of the the, the trick. Uh, Cheap energy is used to pump water up into the reservoirs where it is turned into expensive energy. So the the atomic energy is cheap, the the water energy is expensive and can be sold all over Europe into into these networks. Although in contrast to the cooling towers of the nuclear power stations that are clearly visible, the infrastructure in the Alps is almost invisible and suppressed in the tourists' perception. Even if we see it, we cannot see it because we're in the Alps. So this problem started to attract attention in the late 70s when the public mobilized to protest against NOK's new proposal to create a new reservoir that would flood the Greiner Plain. This is a particularly nice alpine valley, very remote. Uh, There was a conflict which dragged on for over a decade, and in 1986, NOK finally yielded to public and political pressure and abandoned its plans. Subsequently, the parish of Sumvich, which includes the Greiner in its terrain. These are very, very large uh, um, villages. There's 50 people living, but they're enormous uh, terrains and they did because it's basically just mountain area. So um, includes this Greiner, um, was deemed uh, um, to have been disadvantaged by the loss of potential earnings from water rights. Uh, they would have made a lot of money with this uh, dam because it's all on their territory. And they received a symbolic payment from donations. There was a national referendum in '92, and then there was a law which uh, in Switzerland is called the Landschaftsrappen, the landscape penny. And since 1995, financial compensation for preserving the landscape by non exploitation is instituted throughout the country. So, Sumvich, where Zumtos Chapel stands, uh, receives $500,000 per year for not having a dam. So it could be said, of course, I'm exaggerating, but uh, um, I would just like to state that uh, there is an economic connection between the photographs Danusa took in the nuclear power station in Gösken in 1981 and the shots he took in 1988 of St. Benedict. Both reflect burning issues in the 80s, the politics of the nation's energy supply. The fragile chapel in the mountains, with the potential for destruction, albeit themselves already partially destroyed by industry, stands in stark contrast to the rawness of the power station in the heartlands. And yet, the former is dependent on the latter, for we can assume that without the profits created by the energy industry and without the output from nuclear power stations, politicians would not have been in the position to halt the construction of additional hydroelectric plants in the mountains and hence to preserve the illusion of a domesticated nature that is so important for the tourist industry. Now, neither Zumthor nor Danuse allude to the connection between the chapel and the energy debate, um, although both were probably aware of this. They had close links with the region. Danusa's family stems from this area, and Zumto, who had been trained in Basel and New York, lived there since the 70s. During the 70s, when he was working for the Cantonal Department of Historic Monuments, so his office only opens in 79, so he was 10 years uh, working in the Department of uh, Historic preservation, he encountered the dialectics of modernization and destruction firsthand and knew from his daily work the extent of the upheaval in the landscape that um, was happening at that time. So this is another uh, image of this uh, protective housing in Kur, where you see just behind the, um, the uh, this is this wooden shell and here is 
part of this urbanization of the Alps. It takes place in the 70s, and it seems like uh, this uh, door must not touch this terrain because it's, it is, there is no way to represent these different strata, the history of Roman architecture, what's happening here, on one level of representation. And that's, I think, why he needs one and a half years to construct a door, because it's theoretically not possible. So let me conclude. It is interesting to note that Tsum Tor's most recent project, which is currently under construction, again deals with the relation between industrial change and landscapes and makes visible the invisible. Way up in Norway, commissioned by the state who currently intends to develop the country's road system for the tourism industry, he is building a zinc mine museum in Sauda on a territory that is literally undermined by a system of tunnels that are defunct since the late 19th century. He's building a museum uh, in form of a path that will allow the visitors to experience the, industrial, the interrelation between industrial history, the beauty of the landscape, and contemporary architecture. This is a, a photograph of the late 19th century, and this is uh, how uh, the museum will look. Unlike uh, today, where these relations can be theorized, I would argue that the connection between cutting-edge architecture in an apparently intact landscape and nuclear power could, in the late ACs, only be demonstrated through the medium of photography. Or rather, through photography that was overtly artistic. Danuser went far beyond reportage photography when he chose to address the problem of the invisible rather than succumbing to the cooling tower cliche. He could have taken just images of cooling towers like uh, most photographers were doing at the time. And he abandoned the conventions of architectural photography when he chose not merely to illustrate his subject matter but also to interpret. He developed a perspective which allows us, at least from now, back to connect seemingly disparate factors. And it was possible to make this connection because for a short while the barriers between different genres had been lowered and the photographs became the common denominator. For one moment, architecture, uncertain of its role in society and striving to escape the isolation of its ivory tower, put its trust in the mediating powers of photography. And photography, on the way to artistic autonomy where it has now arrived, was enjoying a new freedom that allowed it to use images to make connections that could not be expressed in words. So in terms of cultural history, this chance constellation was very fortress, and in, in, in um, terms of Marcel Proust, uh, it is always important to work and take time to reconstruct the past and relate it to the present. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you very much. We, we would uh, take some questions. Yeah, Philippe, would you take some questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. something that attained a kind of spiritual dimension or, or something, uh, say, in the work of someone like James Turrell, where maybe you have a work that looks like a kind of prehistoric ruin. Or, or if we're talking about uh, in music, Arvo Pert, it sounds like a kind of monastic chant. But the, I think the whole pleasure in the work is in that likeness. And I think that, that relationship of likeness is the relationship of the photograph. Um, and so I think that that that's sort of the perfect place to sort of locate the appeal of Zimter's work. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a question, I guess, about the relationship that you're projecting between, that you're discerning between, say, a lived experience of time, a uh, human experience of time, and on the other hand, a historical time whether it's institutional, like the Catholic Church, or uh, economic, as in the, the hydroelectric developments, a, a larger span of time or temporality that can't actually be experienced. And it, it seems in, in kind of projecting through into your conclusion that the diagnosis is in, at least in Zumtor's architecture, either an incapacity or a decision not to participate in historical time, that the the evocation you get, particularly of the chapel, you know, convincingly demonstrates the participation in lived experience in the kind of in, the, in a, what I'm calling a human time. But it seemed that it's the photography, in particular, in in your instance here, um, but also maybe in the case of the the framing of the Roman ruins, that architecture is really reinforcing its own distance from historical time. And is that a complete? Is that erroneous and as a diagnosis on my part, or is is there a kind of dissonance that's really being structured here between those two temporalities, which I think would would relate again to the Proust, which which you know in one reading is a, is precisely about the incompatibility, the incommensurability of lived human experiential time and historical time. Yeah, I. I None of this is is made explicit. I mean, it's that's uh, I, I'm arguing that that Zumthor, uh, when he writes, he would never write about that. Yeah. Uh, it's probably also wise, <laughs> uh, because the cliche of the Alpine Yeti worked well and 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 s sold well for a while. So why change it? Um, uh, and yes, I would say that that uh, as as a person who is his uh, a, a, a large part of his career, he has to deal with the fact that uh, cultural heritage is destroyed rapidly. So he he spends ten years in in drawing villages and and conserving images, uh, uh, conserving uh, um, uh, um, plans of villages which which are which are very rapidly destroyed and change. Um, so if if he is nostalgic or not, we don't even have to decide. I think it's. I, I don't. I don't even care. Also, I say because this, the intention. I don't, I'm not. It's not so important for me. But I'm sure that this this historic temporality is is always around, and he he must be aware of that. Uh, he's not historicist, so he's not. Um, um, let's say in an, in a sense like uh, uh, Peter Eisenman would be interested in how. Does his architecture relate to Palladio or to 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 um, Terrania or whatever? So he he does not relate to architectural history as a, as a horizon, uh, uh, like Catherine and Cameron don't. So this is a sort of a different way of dealing with with history. Uh, uh, I would say that he looks at history as something which is um, is inseparable from personal experience. Uh, and where where the smell and the um, the movement and uh, the memories and the misunderstandings are always part, uh, which in a way we can never reconstruct like post, uh, but we can produce a texture which allows us to to uh, to travel on this on this area. So uh, the the uh, the for me the the clue is is or the, where where it becomes evident is the. Uh, the discontinuities that's always there. There cannot be a window. It's impossible, theoretical, to make a window or a door uh, because there is no continuity. And this, I think, is something which is um, very, very contemporary. Nobody in 1950 could have... I mean, this, the problem was not there. And I think that uh, this continuity of time and space, which starts to break apart in the early 70s, if one looks at the... Theory like uh, like Lyotard uh, uh, or or the, the the topological discussions or the Mille Plateau, there's various various voices discuss this this uh, rupture and the impossibility to sort of uh, keep a, a time space continued together um, is articulated um, not in words, not at all in words, because I think his writing are are 
it, it, almost useless. Uh, I, I, I only quote him um, for for parts of the interviews, uh, but not his writing because I think it's 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 talking about something totally different. Uh, but in in the um, in the work is there, but one could not see it at that time because first there was not the notion for it, and and then nobody transported it. And we perceive architecture, um, at least me, uh, at least fifty percent or even more, probably eighty or ninety percent via photography. So I don't even know how to to separate the perception of photography or, or reality. Just in the case of Benedict, uh, I had to go there to see that. Um, that uh, my image was, was too narrow. What I like very much on the images also that you showed the photos, and the photos are almost like a dictionary to get close to both, to the architecture and to the landscape. Because I, I know this landscape very well, and the Plauen d'Algreina, you only understand uh, actually with this mood of this black and white, and with the fog, and with the mist, and not the beautiful Swiss landscape, what we usually see as cliché. Uh, and I think the pictures actually open, open an, a totally different way to look at architecture and the context of the landscape. And, and I think that was also fantastic on the exhibition in Bregenzer Kunsthaus, on, on the films, on this very slowly moving. Mm -hmm. So I think for architects to uh, show their work, or to express their work, and to get the people to look in the right way. That is, a, that is actually almost like a task we need to do. You know, what, what sort of, what sort of, how do we educate that people look different? Well, I think that there are, therefore the photos are fantastic. Yeah, and uh, thank you a lot. And I think it's that this is an interesting case where where he totally delegates this. Uh, uh, of course, they, they didn't work together afterwards. That often happens in not only in Switzerland but particularly in Switzerland, so, so it's just like a one encounter and then, and then not again, but it, it, it was, it was, uh, uh, it, it, it's, the architect understands that he has not the means to alone represent, he tried to, he had his drawings in the catalogue, uh, which I think do not work in the same way, uh, and he tried to talk about music also, which is too complex, uh, at least for me, to 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 really follow in in this in this relation. So the the photos were at the right place at the right moment. Yeah, and I think the video was also a, an excellent choice. Yeah, I'm convinced about the argument that you made uh, regarding the photos of the chapel and how they embed this building into a larger uh, matrix of social economic forces. Um, but uh, I'm not convinced that um, Zumtor's collaboration um, with this photographer over time has actually changed his work. Do you think it has and, and how? Uh, no, it does not change the work, no. Um, it um, it has probably uh, influenced the way he presented his work. I mean, I think in in the this is like na late eighties, so that is the the very beginning of uh, uh, certain boom of of uh, of Swiss architecture and sort of style, uh, black and white, uh, earnest, uh, <laughs> uh, and and. He very much uh, remained on that uh, track of uh, of the atmospheric uh, and and of this sort of earnestness uh, and of the um, autonomy and isolation. But it is, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that this was because of the photographer. I mean, he 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 chose the photographer. He controlled it entirely. Uh, of course, he, he was free to do what he wanted, but in the end, uh, the architect would have been free not to show the pictures. Uh, so he, 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 it, it serves him at that moment, and then he does not repeat it. He does not use him for vals. Uh, actually, he has, he has no solution for vals, nor for the um, most recent project. So there has, there has, been, no, there has been no adequate um, 
form of representation for 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 uh, for Cologne for for Bruder Klaus, uh, except for this video installation. But this does not go for for magazines. So so it's everything is on hold. And uh, uh, Danuser, uh, sort of commissioned by someone else, photographed the Thermal Falls in the late 90s, but this was sort of not authorized by uh, Tom Tor. Philip, um, I'm still wondering about your argument in general. Are you giving a reading of Danuse, or do you, are you re giving a, read a, a reading of Zumtor? Or is this just Philip Ursprung looking at images or looking at architecture? Because I have a, I, I have my doubts, especially about Zumtor. I'm a historian, <laughs> so I, I have to tell stories and find out about historical forces and relationships. And the intention of these people, I do not... Um, it's not so important. Yeah, for you my, I want you to understand the text, why certain things uh, come together at a certain moment, why, how these things relate, which are not talked about and are not uh, part of the, of, of the picture normally. So I don't believe in an autonomous history of architecture, and I don't believe in autonomous history of photography, and I don't believe that one can um, isolate this like... Uh, you can you can on, on a table where you where you cut little little pieces. So I, I believe that uh, this, the history is rather a mess, and I, I try to uh, make sense out of that mess. So of course, I that's why I use the word I very often. Um, I want to um, be localized as uh, someone who speculates, so that someone else can say, okay, this is okay, but here you're wrong so that the argument can go further, because I, I do not want to hide between the, the mist of St. Benedict Chapel, so I don't want to sort of have a, a cloud in front of my argument, because I, I, I'm, I'm not artist, not architect, and that doesn't, it doesn't help me at the moment. So that's why I, why I put myself a little bit too much into the, into the picture. No, no, that was on a critique. I think uh, you made a very good, clear mm. um, statement about what is... Uh, that what is today's um, yeah, role of an of an of a critic uh, of a criti critic in, in, in architecture uh, in the sense of not repeating the arguments that are already out there but giving a new reading? Yeah, I, I of course I don't have to sell the product also. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.